Hi, I'm Art Kaplan. I'm at the Division of Medical Ethics at the New York University Grossman School of Medicine in New York City. I think we had a breakthrough on a very controversial subject over the past month. Over and over again, debates have been breaking out, cases going to court, fights coming to ethics committees about what is brain death? How do we know what brain death uh, is? How do we diagnose it? What rights do families have with respect to the diagnosis? Well, the American Academy of Neurology decided to form a task force, and they just issued guidelines on both the definition, tests to use it, and the rights of families. And whether you're a neurologist or someone involved in actually diagnosing brain death or you're dealing with very ill people whose families are trying to direct the kinds of things that you can do or the nurses can do, these guidelines, I think, are excellent. They did a wonderful job, in my view. They've achieved a lot of clarity. First, they tried to handle both adults and children. Children are, if you will, more difficult, and that's been known, to test for brain death. Their brains are smaller. You get more interference, uh, false signals coming from muscle nerve activity that might be going on elsewhere in their bodies. So the guidelines say we're going to try and see whether a person can breathe without support. If it's an adult, one test over a uh, a 24-hour period would be sufficient if you had them off the ventilator and they can't breathe, show no signs of being able to do that. That's a very fundamental test for brain death. But for children, you're going to have to do it twice. So they're saying be cautious. Second, they say it's very important to know what the cause is of the suspected brain death condition. Someone has a massive head injury that's different from a situation in which someone overdoses from drugs or perhaps drowns. Those conditions can be a little deceptive in the case of drowning. Sometimes the brain has protective mechanisms, protect circulation to the brain naturally for a little bit of time. I'm talking, you know, minutes, not hours. But you want to be careful to make sure you know the cause of the massive brain injury or insult that makes uh, someone believe that the patient is brain dead, whether it's a stroke or an embolism or a bleed or a gunshot wound or trauma to the head. Those factors really drive the certainty with which brain death should be pronounced. And I think that's very, very important. They also basically said that what brain death means is the permanent loss of brain function. So you may get a few cells still firing. You may be in a situation because life support is still there where the body looks pink and perhaps might appear to still be alive to someone. But when you know that the damage to the brain is so severe that there's nothing that can be done to bring back the support of heart function and breathing and most likely any ability to sense or feel anything, that is death. I believe it's very important in talking to families to say there are two ways that we pronounce people dead and they're equal. One is to say their heart is stopped, their breathing is stopped, and there's nothing we can do to resuscitate them. Cardiac death. The other is to say their brain has permanently ceased to function in any kind of integrated way. That means no heartbeat, no breathing, no mental sensations. That is death. In approaching families, it is critical that doctors and nurses don't say your relative is brain dead. That gives the family a sense that maybe they're only partially dead, or maybe there's one key organ that has stopped working, but maybe you can bring it back. Death is death. The law recognizes both cardiac death and brain death as death. When you approach a family, if you believe that death has occurred, you say, I'm very sorry, with regret I have to tell you your loved one is dead. If they say, how do you know? You could say, well, we've determined it through brain death or we've determined it through cardiac death. 
but you don't give them a sense that people could be kind of dead or sort of dead or nearly dead. Those states are comas. Those states are permanent vegetative state. They're not the same as death. So you also may be thinking, well, still, what if the family says, I don't want you to do any testing. I don't want to find out whether my patient is dead. The uh, American Academy of Neurology looked at this carefully and said, any test for death can be done without the permission or consent of the family. Why they said that is doctors need to know what steps to take to treat someone. If a person is dead, then treatment is going to stop. It may not stop immediately. There may be issues about organ donation. There may be issues about gathering the family to come to the bedside to say goodbye, because many people think that's more humane than saying goodbye at the morgue or some other setting. All well and good. But patients cannot protect against bad news when it comes to death. We don't want to be doing things to the dead that cost money, are futile because of death, and are using resources that might go to others. So we've got a lot more clarity than we have ever had with respect to the issue of brain death and how it works in any hospital. We have certain tests being off the ventilator, some other tests that the uh, guidelines supply. We know we have to be more careful with children. We know we want to know the etiology or the cause of the brain trauma, the devastating brain injury, to be sure that this is something that really is permanent cessation of integrated brain function. We know that if you believe the person has died, you don't need the consent of the family in order to do a brain death test. You have to do it because there is no point in continuing treatment in expensive ICU settings, in denying resources to others who might want to use those resources. The family can't hold the medical team hostage. And we do know that when we approach someone with the determination, whatever it is, that you lead by saying the person has died and then explain how you determine that, whether it be by cardiac death pronouncement, tried to resuscitate, heart's not beating, or brain death uh, analysis. I'm Art Kaplan at the Division of Medical Ethics at the NYU Grossman School of Medicine. Thanks for watching.